So many details that need attended to, so many things that uh, are thrown at us on a day to day basis that life can just be absolutely draining and exhausting. And I think maybe some of you are here tonight and maybe you're drained, maybe you're tired, maybe you're exhausted, maybe more simply put, you're just simply stressed out. You know, and Jesus never intended for life to be like this. God never intended for our lives to be so chaotic and that we're so exhausted and we're stressed. You know, when Adam and Eve were created, I believe that Adam and Eve was in a complete stress-free environment. I believe they had no stress whatsoever. They walked with God face to face. Their, the, 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 the garden just grew, you know, and they, they picked the fruits of it and the, the vegetables of it, whatever was in that garden. And life was just absolutely carefree and stress-free. But then when, it's when they sinned that that sin caused a separation from God. As soon as they had that separation from God, now all of a sudden their life becomes a little bit more stressful, doesn't it? That separation from God caused them now that they, for the ground to be cursed. Now, instead of that garden just growing with ease, now it's bringing up thorns and thistles. And now it says they have to sweat from the, from the sweat of their brow just to, just to produce this food and tend this garden. So it wasn't until they separated from God that their life got difficult. See, it's the same for us. When we, when we separate ourselves from God and try to do everything ourselves, try to put everything on our shoulders, all our worries, all our stresses, life becomes very difficult. When we separate ourselves from God, things ain't easy as He had intended to be for us. See, God, God wants our lives to be filled with zeal, energy, and, and joy, but worry and exhaustion completely robs us of all that. It drains us. It drains our energy. It zaps every bit of strength from us when we're constantly worrying, constantly worrying, constantly running around trying to fulfill all these things that we need to be fulfilled, and it, it makes us tired. It makes us exhausted. And as humans, we have a tendency to complicate life, don't we? You know, we make things harder than they ever have to be. We tend to focus so much on the problem. And we focus so much on all the things that we need, and we're consumed with trying to figure things out, that we don't even see that the solution is standing right before us. Right in front of us, the solution is right there. The solution is Jesus. Jesus Christ alone is our solution. You know, we, we make our problems, our life, and all the things that we need, and it's so complicated. And the answer is just so simple. It's simply Jesus. The Word says that the simplicity of the gospel brings salvation. It's also the simplicity of the gospel that brings peace and joy and rest to our lives. It's when we're in God's presence that we're in peace. Yeah. It's when we're in His presence that we find true rest for our soul, for our bones. Exodus 33, 14 says, The Lord tells Moses, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Psalm 91, 1 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High God will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Mm -hmm. So in the presence of God is where we find our rest. That's where we find our strength. That's where we find our refuge from the hot sun of life that's beating down on us. He's our shadow. He's our refresh, time of refreshing. If you're here today and, you, and you, you're tired and you're stressed and your life is just in trouble, I want you to know this evening that there is rest and safety for your soul in the heart of God. This is where we find our rest. This is where we find our safety. The best place to be is always in the center of God's heart. He's our refuge and strength. He's our strong tower. He's our safety. So I want to talk to you tonight about three areas in our life that we often find ourselves exhausted in. Three areas in our life that we, all, that we find ourselves exhausted in. One's our Christian walk. Two's our finances. And three's our ministry. So let's talk about the Christian walk. One of the things that will cripple us in our Christian walk is worrying. Worrying just sucks the life out of you. It consumes you. It consumes your days. It consumes your thoughts. And it's so easy to fall into this trap of worrying. Because we have a lot of things to worry about. Don't we? A lot of things to think about. A lot of things that we need. You know, we need to take care of our family. We have bills. We have jobs. We have relationships. We have church. We have all these different things. So we constantly worry. We worry. I'm telling you, it sucks the life right out of us. Worrying, all it does, that's projecting, that's projecting negative thoughts into the future. In the future, events that haven't even taken place yet. We're worrying about something that's not even here. Yes. 
Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Today will have enough trouble of its own. You know, and I, I think about our country and the way people are talking about our country right now. Everybody's worried. All you hear is negative stuff. Everybody's worried. It's all gloom and doom. Our country's going to fall apart. Our country's going to be a disaster. America's going to collapse. But worry about something that's not even here yet. Because right now our country's standing. Right now we're still free. Right now we still have jobs and we're working and we have freedom and it's great. But all, we, all I hear is people saying, oh, our country's going to fall. Our country's going to fail. It's collapsing. But what about now? Let's worry about now. Let's worry about today. Let's worry about what we can do today. Because the only thing that's ever going to change our country anyway is if our country repents and turns its way back to God. That's only going to happen one heart at a time. So instead of worrying about the thoughts of America and speaking all this negative stuff, how about we do something today? Yeah. How about we speak to people and change our heart? One heart at a time will change our nation. And you've seen that happen. Read the stories in the Bible. The key is we've got to turn our worry to worship. We've got to turn our worry to worship. And then when we're worshiping God, when, when all heck's breaking loose in our life and we're stressed out and we got bills and all these different things going on in our life, we just got songs that let go and raise our hands and just worship God. Yeah. See, when we raise our hands, that's a that's a that's a that's a uh, it's a symbol, it's a symbol, isn't it? When cops are chasing a criminal and they point that gun at someone, what's the first thing they do? They raise their hands to say, "I surrender." So we're raising our hands to God, and we instead of worrying, we begin to worship. When we raise our hands to worship God, we're saying, "God, I surrender all my problems to you. I surrender all my struggles to you. God, I surrender all these things that go my life to you because I can't do it." I'm not strong. I swear to you, God, because I know you can take care of this. I know you can help me. I know you can deliver me from this problem. We've got to turn our worry to worship, and God will give us that supernatural peace that we need to have to get through those times of trouble, through our struggles in life, just through day to day life and all the worries that come along with that. We've got to raise our hands and worship God and be surrendered to God, surrendered all to God. I'm telling you, that worship it really will. It'll turn things around. It'll, you'll begin to have this supernatural peace in your heart. You know, we look at Stephen when he's being stoned. You know, here's Stephen being stoned, and he's worshiping God. He's saying, I can't even, God showed him, but he's seen God, and Jesus stands at the right hand of God. But he's worshiping God, and God gave him this peace during this horrific time. I mean, he's being murdered. He's being stoned. And yet he has this supernatural peace about him. So when we begin to worship God, even in the worst struggle, even in the worst tribulation or trial, we can find peace, because we find our peace in Jesus. We're not going to find our peace within ourselves. We're not going to find our peace, you know, meditating some Zen scratch. We're going to find our peace in the Lord. Acts 16, we see Paul and Silas get arrested. All they did was pack a, uh, a spirit, an evil spirit out of somebody. And they get beaten, they get struck naked, beaten terribly, and thrown into the prison, into the worst part of the prison, into, into the center of the prison, into the, basically a hole, the cage rather, where all the other prisoners, um, you know, where they go to the bathroom now, basically. It's basically they're, they're laying beaten and naked in raw sewage, essentially what they're laying in, right? They had a lot of reason to worry, didn't they? A lot more reason than we have to worry, probably. You know, we worry about bills, our electric bills. We worry about, you know, all these different things. How we do so much in a day and our children. They just worried for their lives. They just beaten, stripped naked, laying in raw sewage, not knowing what's going to happen. They didn't know what the next move was. They didn't know what was going to happen. So they had a lot of reason to worry. But what they did, the worst is they began to worship God. They said at the midnight hour, they began to worship God and sing hymns of the Lord and began to pray. And at right that moment, God caused a massive earthquake, opened all the doors, and loosened the chains off of them. Amen. So immediately, their worship set them free from their problem. Amen. And it can be the same thing for us. We just got to turn our worry to worship. We got to turn our worry to worship. Instead of trying to do everything ourselves, instead of trying to put everything upon our own shoulders, and, and, and you know, it's exhausting. It really, really does. Life is not easy. And God never promises that life would be easy. You know, the day-to-day -day life is, is a challenge, you know? My home is a challenge, you know? We're working hard, we're trying to take care of my family, we're all trying to take care of our family, you know, we're struggling with a little bit of money, we do, and things get exhausting. Bills are piling up, but see, we either do everything ourselves, we put everything on our own shoulders, or we can do what God intended us to do, and it's that be still, and let him take care of some things for us. Have trust in God, know that he will take care of you, because he does love you, he is on your side. He's not against us. That's a pretty awesome thing to have the God of all creation on our side. Yeah. But we treat it such a light thing. All the God of all creation is on our side. The God of heaven and earth, the God created all things, is by our side. And we're worried about our electric bill. Mm -hmm. Can God not take care of our electric bill? Can he not take care of the little problems that, that hinder our life? Sometimes we just got to be still. 
and let God take care of it. Sometimes we've got to be still and, and not run around like a madman trying to figure things out. Psalms 46, 10 says, be still and know that I am God. That's the answer right there, church. We need to be still sometimes. Know that we're God. Some of us are so worthy. And we, we just, we're, we're, our wheels are spinning, but we're going nowhere. Be still and know that I'm God. He loves you. He'll take care of you. Worry is just a lack of trust. That's all it is. Worry is a lack of trust. And how do we repair that? Well, I think one is the word of God, obviously. Because the more we read the word of God, the more our faith is going to be stirred up, the more confidence we're going to have in God, that he will take care of us. He will meet our needs. The more we start, you know, we stop worrying and just put faith in him, and we start to see him take care of us in the small things, that our faith is just going to grow, grow, and grow, and grow. And we're going to trust him more, and more, and more, and more. We've got to get in that word. We've got to learn to start letting go a little bit. And just letting God. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So when we're going through a difficult time, go to God, go to God, go to God. Amen. He says, He'll give us that grace and that mercy that we need in our time of need. He'll get us through it. Even when things seem impossible, He'll give us that grace to get through it. And the more that we depend on Him, the more we allow ourselves to depend on Him, the more we're going to grow in that trust and that faith in God. See, God gives us every one of us our breath. Every breath that we breathe is from God. So we have to decide, are we going to use our breath to pursue God and all his unlimited love and his forgiveness and his mercy? Or are we going to use our breath running around panting after all the world's desires and after our own needs that will never allow us to rest? Because those things will never allow us to rest. If we're constantly chasing the things, they're never going to allow us to rest. It's, they always, they always, there's always need to be met. There's always something. We gotta quit chasing those things and chase God. He'll help us through. Uh, the, the second thing, uh, another thing that can uh, really cripple our walk as Christians, really cause a lot of exhaustion, is just simply idleness in our Christian walk. See, as Christians, we gotta keep moving. God never intends us to sit on, on you know, in a one stop spot and be still. So we have to keep moving. Because idleness causes laziness. I know that because I've been through that and I fight that every single day of my life. Idleness causes laziness. The less we do, the less we're more likely to continue to do. The less we do, the harder it is to get going. Then when our physical body is out of shape, if we're overweight, we don't exercise, we don't eat right, we have, no, we have less energy than a person who is in shape. It's the same spiritually. If we're spiritually out of shape, we're going to have less zeal and less stamina to go with for the long haul. We're going to quickly, quickly run out of steam. And then we get exhausted. And half the time we blame God, don't we? Oh, God's not moving my life like he was. No, you're doing less than what he was. And it, listen, every time we stop, every time we take a break, you know, it's that much harder to get going again. You know, when I, when, I, when I was on vacation for a week, you know how hard it was to come back to work? <laughs> it killed me. I was absolutely exhausted. The same thing with our walk with God. Every time we stop, every time we take a break, every time we say, you know what, this week I'm just going to kind of chill and do my own thing, fulfill my own desires, my own needs, and all of a sudden, um, it makes it that much harder to go back into that groove, doesn't it? Don't stop. Keep moving. Keep moving. It's like a car. You know, it sits out front of your house. You never go out and start it. Yeah, that's not it. It's going to go bad. Yeah. When you have a car sitting out there, you got to start it once in a while, don't you? Even if you never leave the house, go out there and start your car. If you don't, you're going to start having problems. But we got to keep moving. we got to keep ourselves oil and all that good stuff. And a third thing that can really cripple our Christian walk and really cause us to run out of steam and be tired and exhausted is patience, lack of patience. Lack of patience. And this is a hard one because I don't know about you guys, but I'm not very patient. I want what I want, I want it now. I can't tell you how many times in my life uh, because my lack of patience caused me a lot of trouble. You know? <laughs> you know, David tells us in Psalms 37 to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. To rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. It's not long until we move ahead of the season that we're called in. It's not long until we move ahead of the season that we're called in. You know, three years ago, uh, I found out my calling in life. That one day I could be a pastor. And this was confirmed through a pastor and through another, a couple other people and through my own prayer. And if I would at that time decide, you know what, I'm ready to go be a pastor right now. I see the vision. I know what I'm going to do. I know my calling. Right now is the time. I don't want to be patient and wait. It could have been an absolute disaster. 
and how many times I see in other churches, you know, and I see other churches rise up, and, you know, there's this church in Dover, and they started in their garage. And I talked to the guy, and said, oh, yeah, you know, uh, I want to be a pastor, but he wasn't in the uh, uh, ordaining me and stuff like that, so I want to start my own church. That church lasted three months. Three months, closed, done. How many times does that happen where people move out of the season that they're calling? Because they see the vision, they get excited, and they think, no, I, I need to do that now. If I would have did that, if I would have took off from here, well, first of all, pastor would have killed me. <laughs> he would have tracked me down, I'm sure. But if I would have attempted to do that and thought that I knew better for my life and thought that, you know, I've seen the vision, so I'm ready to be a pastor now, if that would have happened, you know, everything would have fell apart, for sure. You know, it's only now for all these, uh, for these three years, <laughs> I've seen all the things I did. I had nothing, you know, <laughs> what it takes. To, I had nothing what it took to, to be a pastor, you know. So, I mean, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I'm still gaining the tools that I need to do so. But if I would have moved ahead of my season, man, you know, it would probably destroy everything that God has called me to do, at least for a moment anyway. It would take a long time to repair and refix and get back on track. Uh, another church I used to go to, there was this uh, guy, there was a whole family there at church, and their dad never went to church. Well, he comes to church. And in about two months, you know, they, they sent him up to be to, uh, on the stage in ministry to be drunk. And they just threw them in there very quickly. So I'm glad for our church that we have standards and we make people wait just to, not only for them, but for the church as well. But here, this guy, you know, he just got saved, just started learning about God, just started learning what church is all about, and they throw him in the drums. And, you know, I'm seeing this guy come out of giant people with cases of beer. And it wasn't long after that where in one day he leaves his wife and leaves the church. Just vanishes. It's not only that damage the church, but also damage that individual as well. You know, maybe he just wasn't ready yet. You know, that's just an example of someone jumping ahead of their season. You know, God still, uh, everything has to be in God's time because He equips us with the things that we need. He equips us with the tools that we need for our ministry, for our Christian walk. So it's very important that we understand that. Just because God gives us a vision doesn't mean it's time to get there yet. You know, just be patient and go with the flow. God will give you know, the words of acknowledge Him, directing all your, go direct your paths. So just keep on acknowledging Him, praying for Him, go direct you. He'll let you know when it's time. When we, when we do it our way, everything's a mess. We don't do it God's way. It causes us a lot more work. Because we like shortcuts, don't we? We love shortcuts. You know, we're never satisfied with the right way. We want to go the fast way, the shortest way. And we all got a friend, don't we? He always knows the shortcut. But somehow the shortcut always takes you about an hour longer <laughs> than, you know, what it took to begin with. I got one of those friends. <laughs> I got one of those friends. But I promised him I wouldn't mention his name. So I'm not even going to mention Tammy's husband's name in front of you. So uh, I won't mention that, because I promise. I'm going to stick to my word. But we was going, I forget exactly where we was going. I think we was coming from Patrick's house with a grill or something. But then we had to go to uh, Aaron's sports house or something like that. And I had to go to work. So I'm already pressed for time. Bob knows a shortcut. I knew a shortcut. All right, Bob, you sure? Sure. I know a shortcut. So, you know. Long story short, I'm calling work, and I'm going to be late. <laughs> I'm going to be late, probably 20, 30 minutes late. You know, we got a little lost out here. To, you know, we tried to make a shortcut. It didn't work out, you know. And uh, so, yeah, that. So, okay, okay, we'll see if we get there, you know. So, yeah. So, we, we, you know, we all want blessed, don't we? We all want blessed. We want blessings for our life. We want blessings for our ministry. We want blessings for our Christian walk. We want to have a blessed relationship with God and our brothers and sisters. We just want the blessings that God poured on our lives. But we don't want to go the right way to get there. We don't know the right way to get those blessings. See, the Bible, the Bible, the Word of God gives us boundaries, sets our boundaries on judgment, right. tells us the right way to go. But we like to take shortcuts in that word. We want to get to heaven. We want to have an awesome relationship with Jesus. We want to impact the world for Jesus Christ. We want to impact our families, our loved ones, our friends, but we don't want to go the right way. We want to go our own way. We want to take our own shortcuts. The shortcuts never work. There is no shortcut. There's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Shortcuts can be very dangerous when we take shortcuts. We have heard of buildings collapsing, bridges collapsing, stadiums collapsing, and you find out it's because the workers, the builders, took shortcuts. They didn't do everything they were supposed to do. They didn't maybe put the bridging that they were supposed to put that supports the, you know, just supports the joists, or they didn't put the braces, whatever. But they skipped steps. You know, they wanted that paycheck. They wanted that great result. They wanted the great feeling of having accomplished something for their boss. But because of all the shortcuts, the whole thing collapsed. The whole thing collapsed. 
Okay, Matthew uh, 7, 24. <clears throat> Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. For everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the flood kind of came, and the winds blew and beat the house, and it fell. And great was the fall. And great was the fall. No shortcuts. There's no such thing as shortcuts. You gotta go God's way or no way, because if we go our way, it's gonna lead to a lot of, a lot of uh, misery. It's gonna set us back. Um, we're gonna damage our own walk with God. We're gonna damage other people walk with God, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause us a lot more work, a lot more, you know, it's exhausting, it's going to go over, rebuilding, falling, rebuilding, and it doesn't get exhausting, always fighting against God, fighting against his word, you know, it makes us frustrated, because we see our vision for our life, we know what we're supposed to be, we know what we're supposed to be doing, but when we're not doing things exactly right what we're supposed to be doing, you know, it, 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 it puts up roadblocks for us, it makes us stumble, and it gets frustrating, and that frustration we become, we get exhausted in our walk with God. Zeal and passion are awesome. We need it, zeal and passion. But if that's all we have to go on, if all we have to go on is zeal and passion, then we're going to complete, uh, be depleted of our energy really quick. Mm -hmm. We're going to be exhausted in our walk with God. We're going to have more zeal and passion. We have to have the Word of God. Worship and praise. Prayer to God. See, these are what keeps yeah. us fueled up. These are what keeps us going. Yeah. Zeal and passion alone is not going to get it. And it's going to die out. But if we keep, we keep the Word of God in our life, we keep reading, we keep worshiping, we keep praising God, we keep praying. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue to be fueled up. We're going to continue to have that zeal and that passion. That's where it comes from. You're going to grow weak and tired outside of God's presence. So if you're weak, you're tired, you're tired of coming to church, everything's starting to become mature in your ministry, in your walk with God, and all these things that we have to do, then odds are you're outside of God's presence, or you're not spending enough time in God's presence. Because only when we're outside of God's presence is when we grow weak and tired. So another, another thing that cripples our walk with God or a Christian walk, is unchecked sin. Unchecked sin. It's like a disease. It wears us down. It's the worst disease. It's the worst possible disease we can have. It's like HIV. HIV attacks the immune system. And most people who die of AIDS don't actually die of AIDS or HIV. They die of, of other sicknesses because their immune system is so beaten down and so weak, they easily get sick. They easily catch things. And that's usually why they pass away. And sin, unchecked sin, unrepentant sin is just like that. It beats us down, it wears us down, it weakens our immune system, it makes us so weak. And then we know the devil loves to explain our weaknesses. It takes us down. Psalms 32, 1 through 5. Psalms 32, 1 through 5. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute infinity. That means does not count for sin against them, is what he's saying. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. He says, when I kept silent, he's talking about when, when I didn't repent, when I didn't tell God about my sin, when I didn't ask for forgiveness, that's what he's saying. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into drought of summer. Now watch here what he does. He says, but then I acknowledge my sin to you. In my infinity, I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the infinity of my sin. It's unchecked sin, unrepentant sin. It causes exhaustion. It causes us to be sick. It absence of our energy. It makes us weak. Unrepentant sin separates us from God. And that's what we talk about with Adam and Eve. You know, they, they was in a complete stress-free environment. They had everything going for them. Everything was easy until they sinned. And that sin caused separation from God, and then everything began to become hard for them and difficult. But we don't have to, it doesn't have to be like that for us. Our sin doesn't have to separate us from God because we have a mediator named Jesus Christ who fills in the gap for us. He's our bridge. He's our bridge. So we don't have to be separated from God. We can, we can approach God with confidence. We can approach his throne with confidence. But first, it can't be, it has to be repentant sin. It can't be unchecked or it doesn't cause separation from God. And nothing's going to be easy. Everything's going to be difficult. A whole Christian walk is going to be very, very, very difficult. And I would seem to go unchecked in our life of any kind. 
no such thing as a big or small sin. Sin is sin. It all cripples us just the same. That's the great lie. That's a great deception that one sin is not as bad as another sin. That's how we think, isn't it? Well, homosexuality is a major sin. Murder is a major sin. But, you know, a little lie is here. Or, or, or not even just, just disobedience from God is a sin. So every time we're not obedient to God, when God speaks to us to do something, we don't do it. That's sin. Mm-hmm. It's the littlest things that can really make the heart of our walk. So we move on from our Christian walk to our finances. A lot of us find ourselves to be exhausted in our finances. Because it is exhausting. Mm-hmm. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things he shall add unto you. And all these things he shall add unto you. See, we have a backwards, don't we? This world has a backwards. We want to chase after all those things we need. Right before that verse, he's talking, Jesus is talking about food and shelter and clothes, all these things that people worry about, all these things that we worry about. We want shelter for our family. We want to feed our family. We need clothes. We need new school clothes for our kids. All these different things that can be very stressful. And the world spends so much time, we all spend so much time just chasing after these things. But it's completely backwards. And to the world, it doesn't make sense. But if we just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things he'll give to us. We don't have to work so hard to get those things that we need in life. Because it's God's good pleasure to take care of us. He loves us. But we do it backwards. We spend all our time and all our energy chasing after these things that we need in life. And I'm not saying we don't need them. We need them. They're a need. We need shelter. We need food. We need clothing. But it's stressful trying to get all those things. It's stressful trying to get the money for those things that we need. But we exhaust ourselves chasing after those things. We put God somewhere on the shelf. If not if even on the shelf at all. But he says, if you just <clears throat> seek me first, I'd give you all those things that you need. You wouldn't have to work so hard. It wouldn't be so difficult. It wouldn't be so stressful. Because he'll take care of you. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Seek his righteousness. So he's talking about obedience and seeking God and linking that to the things that we need. If we seek righteousness, he'll bless us. There'll be blessings for our life. We've got to seek after the things of God first. Uh, another thing that makes uh, our, financial, our financial system situation difficult and exhausting is, is tithing. That can fix it. When we give to God's kingdom, when we give to God's kingdom, we're becoming part of God's economy. I know we all heard pastors say that many times, but it's so true. When we give to God's kingdom, we're becoming part of his economy. All things are going to heck in our, in our country and the economy is down. God's economy is still good. He doesn't run out. He has all the resources, unlimited resources that we need. So when we give to God's kingdom, we become part of that. Proverbs 3, 9, 10 says, says, honor the Lord with your possessions, the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. It's his promise to us. We can't outgive God. He always gives us more in abundance than we can give to him. Malachi 3, 10 and 11 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, and there may be food in the house, in my house. And test me in this, he says. The only time the Lord God just says, test me. Test me in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, then there will be no room to receive it. Can you imagine that? No room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, that he will not destroy the fruits of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. You know, we always hear that first part of scriptures, but the second part is so much more, well, not so much more important, but it's, it's just, it's, it's an eye opener. Because if we could just tithe, we could give our, the first of our increase to him. That first ten percent to him, he says, he will restore the devourer. So all those things that are always going on in our life that are stuck in our finances, cars breaking down, if if your meat tires won't flat every every other day, <laughs> you know, always something. You know, a lot of that will be taken care of because I'll rebuke the devourer. Because the devil, he likes to devour and consume everything that God has for us. He wants to be financially burdened. That way we take our eyes off of God. He doesn't care if we're rich or poor, does he? If we're rich, that can bring all kinds of problems too. We both take our eyes. All he wants is our eyes to be off the Lord. So if he can do that by causing us to be poor and to rob us of our finances, he'll do that every single time. But if we give, that's like a block for that, isn't it? Because God says he promises us. He says, test me in this and see if I won't uh, overflow your barns. See if I won't uh, rebuke the devourer. He promises you that. See, the devil wants to restore everything. But God says, just give your tenth and I'll take care of that. That's enough.
Another thing for our finances that will make it a lot easier is giving. As brothers, as, uh, brothers and sisters of God, we need to be givers, don't we? No, we, we have to be givers. We hold on to money so tight sometimes. But we have to be willing to let that go sometimes. And it's like sand. I'm sure you guys heard it before, but it's like we hold money tight. It's like holding that sand tight. No matter how hard, like the tighter you squeeze your hand, that sand's going to start to trickle out of your hand. It doesn't make sense at all because it's like you're, you're squeezing it harder. You're, you're, you're putting more pressure on the gap. Yet the sand keeps choking away. Well, same, it doesn't make sense either when you're trying to say, if you, go, if, you know, if you hold on to your money, you're actually going to lose more money. It doesn't make sense, does it? But it's exactly how it works. If we would just be willing to give and be givers, we'll actually have more money and be more blessed than we would if we wasn't. 1 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 says, But this I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows abundantly will also reap abundantly. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have a sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. That's his promise to us. That's what he does for the given heart, for the giver. He's not afraid to let go sometimes. It doesn't mean to give every single thing away so we have our families take care of, but we also can't hold everything so tight and so dear. Don't love things that don't love you back. Yeah. Proverbs 11, 24 says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Does not go against all the, all the, all the knowledge of the world. You mean to, get, to, to be richer, I give? I freely give and I get richer? Absolutely. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. You know, uh, I work in the food industry, and it amazes me the, the Christians that come in and pay so tight with their money. <laughs> they, they'll leave me a track. And this happens all the time, believe it or not. And it's sad. They leave me a track with a dollar. That track's not going to feed my kids. <laughs> he wants you to love a God. Show me the money. <laughs> you know, that's what, that's, what, that's, what, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, really, is that how you chose to love me with a track and a dollar to feed my kids and my family and take care of things I need? I see people treat servers like crap who make mistakes. It's a salty food, people. It's salty food. But I see people get rude with servers and say, no, I'm not serving them. They made a mistake. How about we show them that they're more important than food, that we love them more than food, that we love them more than their ability to serve? How about that? we got to be one to let go. Don't be a cheap stick with Christians. <laughs> Especially in shows. <laughs> Just saying. Acts 20, 35, Paul says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. It is more blessed. What does he mean by blessed? It's more blessed. That's the only way to describe it. Your blessings will be more. You have more blessings in your life, financially, spiritually, in your ministry, in your walk with God, in your family. You'll see more fruits of your labor if you give. Because you'll be more blessed to give than to receive. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, that we find ourselves exhausted is our ministry. Our ministry. It can be exhausting if we do it the wrong way. If we don't go about it God's way, it can become very exhausting and very tiresome. Uh, sometimes in ministry we just simply feel unqualified. You know, we, I know I spoke with this when I first, first started uh, getting involved in the church, and I remember pastor first asked me to be an usher, and uh, I must have made a face and then realized, he's like, oh, well, it's a good place to start, you know, he's trying to reassure him. So I think he kind of misunderstood that look, and think, uh, I don't want to be an usher. But actually I was thinking to myself, man, I don't feel I'm good enough to stand up here and be an usher. That's, a, that's what the look was. That's actually what I was thinking. Honestly, God, I said, I, I'm not good enough to stand up before him and represent anything officially for this church. You know? I know what I'm about. I know what's in my heart. I know what's in my mind. I know the thing that I struggle with. You know, I know all these things. But you know, it's that feel, when we feel unqualified, when we, when we, we're, what we're doing is we're uh, determined by our own action by ourselves if we're qualified. Or not. We're really God did for us to qualify. But we look back, we're constantly looking back at who we was and who we were. You know, it's going to make it very hard to walk forward. We're going to stumble, we're going to fall, it's going to be difficult. So the first thing we got to do in ministry is realize that we are qualified because the blood of Jesus Christ qualifies us. That's the first thing. The second thing is we got to keep at the feet of Jesus. And by that, I mean we need to be close to him. We need to have a personal, intimate relationship with him. Because I see so many times people get burned out so quick because they're doing a lot of, a lot of doing, but they're not taking that time off to be in his presence. They're not soaking her in. In Luke 10, we see a story of Mary and Martha. And, verse, and, and, and as Martha's home, and she opened up her home to Jesus, right? And she's preparing dinner, but she's so busy, she's, she's so consumed by all the things that she has to do to prepare this dinner, she's running around like a crazy woman. And finally, in verse 39, here's Mary, it says, sitting at the feet of Jesus, and this frustrated Martha. 
And she looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, tell her to help me. That's what she said. Tell her to help me. And that came out of a heart of frustration because she was so busy because she wasn't so happy to Jesus. She wasn't even enjoying it. There's Jesus in her home, at her house. And she's too busy to even realize that he's there. He's, she's too worried about all, these things, all the things that she has to do. Of course, in the back of mind, she knows she's doing it for God. She knows that God's here, but yet she's so busy doing all those things for God that she's not even enjoying the presence of God when he's right there in her home. It's in her home, but Mary's the one sitting at this feet. So she said, tell her to help me. Because when we're doing things in our own strength, we're not enjoying the presence of God in our ministry, don't we get frustrated a lot easier? We're cleaning the church. We get frustrated. No one else is helping clean the church. Why is it all on my shoulders? Why am I the only one cleaning the church? And that's what happens when we're doing it in our own strength. Listen, get into the presence of God. that will change all that. Before you come in here, pray. God, it's just such an honor to be doing even the smallest of things for you, Lord God. So I don't do this for pastor. I'm not doing this for all the people that come to this church. I'm not doing it for, I'm doing it for you, Lord God. So I want to do this for you. I want to create an environment here where people feel it's clean and they feel welcomed here. I'm doing this for you, oh God. When we have that attitude, when we pray to God and stay in his presence, we're not going to get frustrated. Because we're no longer doing it for ourselves and for the church, for all these people we're doing this for. No, we're doing it for God. And that's a blessing. And that's not just about cleaning. That's just one of them. Anything in ministry, whether it's up here on the stage, whether it's back in the sound room, but whatever it is that you do in ministry, whatever it is your ministry, you're going to get burned out really quick if you're not soaking in the presence of God. Because then it becomes all about you and you doing all these different things and you running around and then you're going to start getting a bitter heart when you see other people not doing as much as you. Who cares about these other people? I mean, in, in terms of what they're doing, worry about yourself and what you're doing. Are you doing this for them? Or are you doing this for God? It really changes your attitude. So he said, she says to him, tell her to help me. But Jesus tells her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better. It will not, and this will not be taken away from her. <coughs> you know, every time I read that, it just it just really sinks into my heart because it's so easy to become so busy in all that we do. And, and, and the more you do, the more you put on your plate, the easier it is to forsake that personal intimate relationship with Jesus. And if we don't have that, we're going to dry out. We're going to get burned out. It's, it's going to happen. There's no way around it. You have to be in the presence of God. When we're not at his feet, we get tired, and we get burned out in our ministry, and we get frustrated. It's just going to happen. And the third thing I want to talk about in our ministry is Christ has to be the focus. He has to be the center. He has to be the center of it all. You know, I see ministries collapse because they have all these things going on. They have all these meetings and all these groups and all these fellowship things. But Jesus, somehow, which maybe, maybe that was the start, he was the center of everything. But slowly, they got away from that, and it just all became about the fellowship. It all became about the, the sport, or this group, and that group, and all of a sudden, Jesus started taking the side step to it. Jesus has to remain the center, or ministries and churches will collapse. Jesus has to be the absolute center. He has to be the focus. We can't ever allow it to be about us in ministry. We can never allow it to be about us. As, uh, we need to have the same heart John the Baptist when he said in John 3.30, He must increase, but I must increase. That's how our ads need to be in our life. It needs to be less of us and more of him. Because if it comes about, if it comes about us in ministry, the same thing we do is burn out and we get exhausted and then our short run to be as fruitful. Less of us and more of him. He needs to be the center. He needs to be the focus. Um, also, in ministry, you know, we're called to do good. We're called to do, uh, do random acts of kindness to strangers. And we're called to help people in need, but you know, I don't know about you, have you ever been burned by anybody? Has anybody ever burned you or taken advantage of you? It happens. And see, when we when we give, and God's not the center of even that, then we're going to grow weary in doing good, aren't we? We're going to grow weary in helping people. So we begin to become a, a, a recluse, you know, and just and just a fend for ourselves and don't want to give to anyone else or help anybody else because we've been burned, we've been hurt, we've been betrayed, we've been taken advantage of. But it's hard to swallow, but that stuff makes us upset. It's hard not to be upset when someone takes advantage of us or burns us or, you know, whatever. But if we get so upset about it, listen, then God probably wasn't the center of that gift. It probably wasn't about God at all. It's probably just a gift of having the back or that we expected something or, you know, we always expect something. And I'm not saying money back, but we expect praise and thanks, don't we? Doesn't that offend us if someone doesn't say thank you? It does. I remember one time I forgot to thank my, my, my grandfather. <laughs> And that was the biggest deal in the world, you know. And, um, 
And, 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 and yeah. I shouldn't say thank you, but, but you know, I just why, why, why do we get here? Thank you. Is to get a pat on the back? Is it to make us feel better about ourselves or for God? Because if we just if we just wrap our brains around the idea that when we give to someone, we're actually giving to God, then it becomes a, a, a much easier thing to do. Then when we get burnt or we get hurt or we get betrayed, it's not going to bother us as much. We're not going to become angry and bitter and tired of giving. We're not going to grow weary in our giving. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for out of the proper time we will reap a harvest, if we do not give up. If we do not give up. And I promise you, if God's not the reason for our giving, if we're not taking the attitude that we're actually giving to God when we give, we're going to give up, or we're going to get, we're going to get weary of doing good. It happens. We've got to keep Jesus at the center. We've got to keep him in focus. If we keep Jesus at the center, if we keep him in focus, and then our ministry is going to be so much easier. We're not going to find ourselves burned out and tired and weary and frustrated. I want to start closing. We talk about three areas of our life that we find ourselves exhausted in. These are, these are just three, three of many areas in our life that we find ourselves exhausted in. Three of many. And there's many things in our life that zap the energy out of us. But the solution of all these things are the same answer. Jesus Christ. We gotta stay in his presence because in his presence we find rest. In his presence we find the time to refresh him. In Matthew 15, there was a multitude of people that says following Jesus for three days. For three days they followed Jesus. And they was tired, they was exhausted, they was without food, they just wore out. And Jesus turned to his disciple in verse 32 and he says, I have compassion on the multitude because they have not continued with me for three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. So it's when we're following Jesus, when we're in his presence, we can be sure that God's not going to send us out tired and weary or broke or hungry. It's his will to make sure that we're strong and strengthened. We're not going to faint on the way. If we're following Jesus, he's going to take care of us. So Jesus takes these seven loaves of bread, takes these three fish, and he blesses them and multiplies them and feeds them. And then he sends them out. He doesn't want to send you out tired. He doesn't want you to be exhausted. He doesn't want to be... If you follow Jesus like they were, like the multitude was, if you follow Jesus... Let him go of all the other pursuits. He will take care of you. He will refresh you. He will give you what you need to be sustained. Because he wants to send you out. He wants to send you out with power, with strength. Not exhausted and tired and weak. But come to follow of Jesus. If they wasn't following Jesus and they were just wandering around the wilderness for three days, they wouldn't have got fed. But because they were in the presence of the Lord, he took care of them. He refreshed them. He made sure they had something to eat so they didn't grow weary and faint on the way when he sent them. So the key to not getting exhausted is, is simply Jesus. He's the key. The key to exhaustion is Jesus. Without the care of a shepherd, sheep would soon be in trouble, wouldn't they? Without the care of a shepherd, the sheep would be in trouble. If sheep followed other sheep or tried to lead themselves, the flock would soon be wore out, in danger, and deprived of what's needed to survive. And the same thing happens to us. When we let the world or ourselves define our need for rest, we put our hearts at rest. We'll say again, when we allow the world or ourselves to define our need for rest, we put our own hearts at risk. And the good news today is that we have a good shepherd. His name is Jesus. He doesn't want us to drive so hard that we fall down from exhaustion. He doesn't want us to go through life without nourishment and refreshment. When we are exhausted and we feel like, like we're just doing what we have to do, it's then that he invites us in to pause and to rest. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down and read pastures. He leaves me beside the still waters. He refreshes my soul. I think of that which the enemy bow our heads, close our eyes. Jesus Christ loves you. He loves you so much. If there's anyone here tonight, we have not made heaven your home. We have not asked the Lord Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You have not repented for your sins. This is, this is a chance for you tonight to raise your hand and say, God, I surrender. I can't do it myself. I need you. I know I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. If that's you tonight and you've never done that, I'd like to do that tonight. I'd like to see you raise your hand. Don't let nothing hold you back. Don't let pride or fear. This is between you and God. You know what you need. If you've never made heaven your home, you need to make that right with God and raise your hands tonight. If you backslid away from God, you served a God at one time, but no longer a servant God like you know you should be. If there's a problem with your relationship, if 
you're struggling and you know you're struggling, you know you're not right with God, you know you're not where you're supposed to be with God, if that's you tonight, you want to make that right, you want to rededicate your life, and raise your hand. Anyone at all? I'm going to move on then. I'm going to change the order of this call this evening. Some of us are tired. Some of us are exhausted. For many reasons, maybe you're here tonight and you're exhausted because you're constantly stressed out and worried about life and finances and all those things that life carries with it. Maybe you're here tonight and you're feeling exhausted in your Christian walk. You're getting tired. You're getting weary. Or maybe you're getting burnt out in the ministry. Maybe you're here tonight and things that was once so easy are becoming more difficult. Maybe you're here tonight and those things that once once you love to do so much and was a delight to do is becoming a chore. Maybe it's causing you to be bitter or frustrated. If that's you tonight, I want to open up this altar for any of those reasons. Because God will give you rest. It's in his presence that you find rest. So I'm going to open up this altar if we just stand and worship God together. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 20, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. The only place you're going to find rest is in Jesus. If you're burnt out, if you're feeling tired, come to this altar. Make it right with God. That's why I entitled this sermon tonight, Come to the Water. Because only in those waters will you find times of refreshing. Are you tired? Are you wore out? Then come to the water. That living water that will refresh you and never make you thirst again. Don't hold back. Come get your rest. It's only found in Jesus. Why go through life exhausted and tired when you can have refreshment and zeal and energy? It's only found in God. You want peace? It's found in God. You want you want time for refreshment? It's found in God. Amen. Let's just stand up and worship God together. Found on you, will. Uh, no,